From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! The Department of Justice and the FBI uh, feel that this is a extraordinarily reckless step to take because the information hasn't been vetted. This is not about the facts. This is about a narrative that the chairman wants to put out, a misleading narrative, uh, to undermine the FBI, undermine the department, and ultimately undermine Bob Mueller. A showdown is brewing in Washington as the White House prepares to release a controversial Republican memo, despite opposition from the FBI, the Justice Department and Democratic lawmakers. Are Trump and his Republican allies trying to discredit Special Prosecutor Robert Mueller's investigation of President Trump? We'll get the latest, then to Afghanistan. Our warriors in Afghanistan have new rules of engagement. Along with their heroic Afghan partners, our military is no longer undermined by artificial timelines, and we no longer tell our enemies our plans. As Trump promises a new strategy in the longest U.S. war in history, we'll look at why civilian casualties are soaring in Afghanistan. On Saturday, more than 100 people died in Kabul when an ambulance packed with explosives blew up. We'll go to Kabul. Then, is everything you know about depression wrong? We'll speak with Johan Hari, author of Lost Connections and covering the real causes of depression and the unexpected solutions. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The FBI said Wednesday it has grave concerns over President Trump's plans to release a four-page document written by Republican House Intelligence Committee Chair Devin Nunes, purporting to show the FBI abused its power when it began surveying, uh, surveilling Trump campaign adviser Carter Page in 2016 due to his dealings with Russia. Supporters of President Trump claim the memo offers proof the FBI's investigation was tainted by politics from the start, in part because the FBI won approval of the wiretap by citing a dossier funded by supporters of Hillary Clinton. The memo is expected to lay blame on the actions of Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, the same man who is the only official with the authority to fire special prosecutor Robert Mueller. Earlier this week, House Intelligence Committee Republicans voted along party lines to declassify the memo, which had become a rallying cry for President Trump and his supporters. In a highly unusual statement issued Wednesday, the FBI said it was, quote, provided a limited opportunity to review this memo the day before the committee voted to release it. As expressed during our initial review, we have grave concerns about material omissions of fact that fundamentally impact the memo's accuracy. Speaking Wednesday, the ranking Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee, Adam Schiff, echoed the FBI's concerns. This is not about the facts. This is about a narrative that the chairman wants to put out, a misleading narrative, uh, to undermine the FBI, undermine the department, and ultimately undermine Bob Mueller. And, of course, the danger in all of this, besides the obvious one of politicizing the intelligence process, uh, is that it send a message to the White House that he can fire Rod Rosenstein or he can fire Bob Mueller, and there are GOP members who are so vested uh, in his presidency that they will roll over. Uh, and that, that will cause a constitutional crisis if that's the message he takes from this. Congress member Schiff later said committee chair Devin Nunes had made material changes to a version of the memo he sent to the White House and that the changes were not approved by the committee. Meanwhile, The New York Times reports special counsel Robert Mueller is investigating how top Trump officials worked to put forward a false version of events surrounding a meeting at Trump Tower in the summer of 2016 between Russians and senior campaign officials. According to The Times, a former spokesperson for Trump's legal team, Mark Corallo, is planning to tell Mueller about a conference call when White House communications director Hope Hicks said emails about the meeting, quote, will never get out. The statement could be viewed as contemplating a obstruction of justice. The director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention abruptly resigned Wednesday, following a report she bought shares in a tobacco company after she took the reins at the top U.S. public health agency. Brenda Fitzgerald's resignation came after just six months on the job and after Politico reported she purchased up to $15,000 of shares in Japan Tobacco. As CDC director Fitzgerald also bought shares in pharmaceutical and healthcare companies that critics say pose potential conflicts of 
of interest. In Virginia, an Amtrak train chartered by Republican lawmakers crashed into a garbage truck outside Charlottesville Wednesday, killing one of the truck's passengers and injuring two others. Three people aboard the train were also lightly injured, including Minnesota Congressmember Jason Lewis, who was taken to a nearby hospital. The crash occurred as the lawmakers were headed to an annual Republican Party policy retreat in West Virginia. The Trump administration said Wednesday it'll reauthorize TPS, that's Temporary Protected Status for Syrian refugees, but it said it'll bar any more Syrian citizens from applying to the program. TPS benefits just 6,900 Syrians living in the U.S. The United Nations says some 5.4 million people have fled Syria since 2011. The Associated Press reports two government officials said this will be the last time the Trump administration extends TPS for Syrians. In recent months, the administration ended TPS for as many as a quarter of a million Salvadorans, as well as tens of thousands of Haitian, Nicaraguan and Sudanese immigrants. In Syria, human rights groups say the civilian death toll is mounting in the northern city of Afrin, where Turkey's military is pursuing a bombing campaign and ground offensive against the U.S.-backed Kurdish forces who control the region. On Wednesday, the Syrian Kurdish YPG militia circulated video showing what it said was the aftermath of an attack on civilians in Afrin. I was on the road when it was shelled. I was injured in my head and my legs. Do we look like soldiers? It is not a military area. I had already fled my village with my family, from Jalama village. Russia's foreign ministry said Wednesday the Turkish offensive in Afrin has killed several hundred people, including civilians. Meanwhile, the Turkish offensive has left an ancient temple in the region seriously damaged. Photos show the 3,000-year-old site of Aindara reduced to rubble after it was hit by Turkish airstrikes. In Turkey, Amnesty International is condemning the Turkish government after it ordered the release of Tanner Kilic, Amnesty International's Turkey chair and then promptly reversed its decision and rearrested him. Kilic was first arrested last June, along with 10 other human rights activists and accused of supporting terrorism. If convicted, they face up to 15 years in jail. In a statement, Amnesty International said, quote, "...over the last 24 hours, we have borne witness to a travesty of justice of spectacular proportions, to have been granted release, only to have the door to freedom so callously slammed in his face is devastating for Tanner, his family, and all who stand for justice in Turkey." The U.S. State Department's designated Ismail Haniyeh, the head of the Palestinian political party and militant group Hamas, as a terrorist. The move comes as the Trump administration continues to face worldwide protest over its decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital, and as the U.S. slashes funding to U.N. agencies helping Palestinian refugees. This is Hamas spokesperson Ismail Radwan. It is clear that putting the name of Ismail Haniya on the terrorism list by the Americans came at a time that the U.S. administration is targeting Jerusalem, putting sanctions on and preventing aid to the U.N. refugee agency, UNRWA. This is a continuation of the crimes against the Palestinian people. The U.S. administration has cast itself as an enemy of the Palestinian people. It's taking the side of the Zionist occupation. This shows that the U.S. administration is working against the aspirations of free Palestinian people in liberation and achieving independence. In Britain, the former editor of the BBC's China desk, Carrie Gracie, told members of parliament Wednesday the BBC is failing to abide by pay equity laws by paying men more than women. Gracie recently stepped down after serving three decades at the BBC, accusing the publicly funded broadcaster of secretive and illegal behavior. You know, we're not in the business of producing toothpaste or tires at the BBC. Our business is truth. Oh, we can't operate without the truth. If we're not prepared to look at ourselves honestly, how can we be trusted to look at anything else in our reporting honestly? It is, it just won't do, it can't be a starting place to not deal with the, the facts. In Michigan, more women have stepped forward to say they were sexually abused by USA Gymnastics team Dr. Larry Nassar as girls, raising the number of his accusers to at least 265. This is Jessica Tomashow speaking at the third of Nassar's sentencing hearings Wednesday. I'm Jessica Tomashow. I'm, I'm 17 and a senior in high school. I'm victim A in both Eaton County and Ingham County criminal cases. I was sexually assaulted by Larry Nassar when I was 9 and 12 years old. What you did to me was twisted. You manipulated me and my entire family. How dare you?
A new study finds roughly half of all U.S. veterans of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan who need mental health care do not get it. The congressionally mandated report by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine finds staffing shortages and bureaucracy at the VA leaves many vets unable to find treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder, substance abuse and depression. The Department of Veterans Affairs recently reported about 20 U.S. veterans commit suicide each day. In Newark, New Jersey, federal prosecutors have dropped corruption charges against Democratic Senator Bob Menendez. Wednesday's decision came just two weeks after the Justice Department initially said it would seek to retry the case after a jury deadlocked over charges last November. Menendez was accused of peddling influence on behalf of New Jersey ophthalmologist Solomon Melgan in exchange for flights on private jet, luxury hotel stays and six-figure campaign contributions. Senator Menendez, who's running for re-election in November, has denied the charges. And in Hong Kong, lawmakers voted Wednesday to ban the sale of ivory, a move hailed by animal rights campaigners as a major step toward protecting elephants. This is Michael Lau with the World Wildlife Fund in Hong Kong. This would show the commitment by Hong Kong government towards conserving the African elephants. Um, what is needed next um, is uh, step up the enforcement uh, to make sure that um, there will uh, no longer be any illegal trade into Hong Kong or through Hong Kong. Hong Kong is the world's largest market for ivory sales. Its ban came one month after authorities in mainland China adopted a similar prohibition. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Nermeen Sheikh. Welcome to our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. A showdown is brewing in Washington as the White House prepares to release a controversial Republican memo, despite opposition from the FBI, the Justice Department and Democratic lawmakers. The four-page memo, written by House Intelligence Committee Chair, Republican Congress member David Nunes of California, purports to show that the FBI abused its power when it began surveilling Trump campaign adviser Carter Page in 2016 due to his dealings with Russia. Supporters of President Trump claim the memo offers proof that the FBI's investigation was tainted by politics from the start, in part because the FBI won approval of the wiretap by citing a dossier funded by supporters of Hillary Clinton. The memo is expected to lay blame on the actions of Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, the same man who is the only official with the authority to fire Special Prosecutor Robert Mueller. Well, on Wednesday, the FBI, which is led by Trump appointee Christopher Wray, issued an unusual statement, fiercely critical of the imminent release of the memo, saying, quote, we have grave concerns about material omissions of fact that fundamentally impact the memo's accuracy. Then on Wednesday, uh, at night, the rank Ranking Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee, Adam Schiff, claimed Nunes had made, quote, material changes to the secret memo before sending it to the president. This comes as the White House appears to be preparing to release the memo. On Tuesday night, President Trump was caught on mic at the State of the Union, speaking with South Carolina Republican Congressman Jeff Duncan. Let's release the memo. Oh, yeah. oh don't worry. 100 percent. Can you imagine that? Duncan asked if he was releasing the memo, and President Trump said 100 percent. This is not the first time House Intelligence Chair David Nunes has been at the center of a controversy. In April, he supposedly recused himself from investigation into Russia's alleged ties to Trump associates and Russia's role in the 2016 U.S. election after he illegally made classified information public. This came after The New York Times revealed White House officials had met secretly with Nunes to show him classified U.S. intelligence reports detailing how Trump associates were incidentally swept up in surveillance carried out by American spy agencies as they conducted foreign surveillance. Nunes later walked back his recusal. We're joined now by Marcy Wheeler. She's an independent journalist who covers national security and civil liberties, running the website emptywheel.net. We're speaking to her in Lansing, Michigan. Um, <clears throat> Marcy, explain exactly what this memo is. This is a firestorm in Washington, a uh, pitting Trump's own appointee, uh, the head of the FBI, against Trump himself. So the memo purports to be a review of FISA, they claim, abuses, um, primarily focused on a FISA warrant targeted at Carter Page, who at one point was a foreign policy advisor of the, of the Trump campaign, 
although the FISA warrant was not approved until he was off the campaign, which is just one of the ways we already know that this memo is misleading because um, it, it, it didn't target the campaign. It targeted somebody the campaign got rid of because of his ties with Russia. So that's the first thing. And it does, it focuses, it, 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 it is reportedly uh, emphasizes the fact that the Christopher Steele dossier, which was uh, that part of the dossier, an opposition research dossier, was paid for by the DNC and Hillary Clinton's campaign. And it complains that, that that dossier was one of the things used to get the FISA warrant against Carter Page. We can assume that it therefore downplays other things that we already know about. For example, that Carter Page in 2013 was being recruited by Russians and uh, FBI kind of kept tracking him in the interim period because they were worried about his ties with the Russians. Uh, we assume that there are a number of other sources for the FISA application. And again, those are all going to be downplayed in the four-page memo. Well, Marcy Wheeler, can you explain uh, uh, a little more why the Republicans and Trump want this memo released? Well, they want to find an excuse to fire Rod Rosenstein, but, but even there, there's a problem. Um, Rod Rosenstein, there are actually conflicting reports about when the last of these applications was submitted, it was either March or April. Uh, New York Times has reported that it was April after Rod Rosenstein bec became Deputy Attorney General on April 26th. But if that's the case, regardless of which it is, it means that two applications using the dossier had already been approved by the FISA court, uh, one of which came after the dossier was made public. So. Either Rod Rosenstein, all he did was sign the last application that had already gone through approval processes in March, right when he came in as Deputy Attorney General, or he wasn't involved at all. But they are searching for some excuse such that they'll be able to remove Rosenstein and therefore get to Mueller. And explain exactly what that last part is, why they want to get rid of Rod Rosenstein and how that will get them to Mueller. So the only way you can remove Mueller is if his supervisor finds him, not the only way, but the only way that isn't going to cause a huge firestorm is if his supervisor uh, finds Mueller to have conducted unethical acts or uh, engaged in improper activities. Rosenstein is his supervisor because uh, Jeff Sessions is recused. And so you need to, A, remove Rosenstein and then put in somebody who would be willing to fire Mueller. People, people talk about uh, the EPA director. No one thinks, for example, that the third in, in command of DOJ, Rachel Brand, would do it. So, you know, you've, you've got to, A, remove Rod Rosenstein and then, B, put in some partisan hack who would be willing to fire somebody who, by all appearances, is just engaging in a typical investigation. And why, why, Marcy, do the Democrats not want this memo released? Well, they argue two things. One, that it's misleading. As I laid out, it's, not going, it's going to misrepresent Rod Rosenstein's involvement. It's going to downplay the fact that this, that this application, uh, that, that applications against Carter Page were approved on at least two occasions before Rod Rosenstein got involved. It's going to downplay the degree to which Carter Page was already off the Trump campaign. It's going to um, misrepresent how centrally this dossier played in the application. So that's one reason the Democrats don't want it released. Another reason they don't want it released uh, is that they say that the memo itself exposes sources and methods. And so normally everybody on the House Intelligence Committee kind of goes overboard protecting sources and methods, protecting the secrets that they learn in the course of their business. And in this case, Nunes has thrown that all out the window. He's using, by the way, to release it, uh, a, a kind of a, a, a legal measure that Congress has available to them to release classified information. It was discussed uh, with the release of the torture report. It would have been appropriate to use it with the torture report. In this case, it's probably not an appropriate use of the law, but 
it hasn't been used. It is, it is not used because normally when the intelligence committees want to release something, they go in a back and forth discussion with the underlying agent, with the agencies, in this case FBI. Um, but, but FBI is also trying to protect, it's quite clear from what DOJ said last week, uh, other intelligence agency assets, so probably NSA and CIA, and also foreign uh, d information from foreign partners. So um, there was a report last week where the Dutch intelligence was making it quite clear that they're less and less comfortable sharing intelligence with the Trump administration. That's one of the reasons you don't release underlying sources and methods, because then we can't partner with foreign partners as well. There, there's one other, I would say, illegitimate reason not to release this memo, and that is because um, FISA, the law that allows the government to target people in the United States uh, as suspected spies rather than as suspected criminals, it's been in place for 40 years. When it was passed, Congress envisioned that sometimes defendants who were collected on using FISA warrants would get to review the underlying dossier, would get to review whether the application was fair, um, but no defendant in history has ever gotten that review. And, and Devin Nunes didn't care about that until Carter Page was targeted. But it is something that I think Congress should revisit, should have revisited, by the way, in, in the 702 reauthorization that was just passed a couple weeks ago. Um, but DOJ also doesn't want this underlying report to be released because it's going to make it easier for defendants to see what, the, what DOJ uses when it's targeting people with FISA warrants, and, and they don't want that precedent. But the precedent would be, I think, useful. So yesterday, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, a fierce defender of President Trump, the White House press spokesperson, uh, said Trump hadn't—she didn't believe—had read the, uh, the memo that he said he's going to release uh, at, when it was caught off mic at the State of the Union talking to a congressman. Um, and I wanted to ask you about the sort of bigger issue here. It seems like the tables are turned. The Democrats, at least progressives, have been fierce questioners of the FBI over the decades um, uh, and about the national security state uh, going, uh, you know, overreaching, to say the least. Now all the tables are turned, and the Trump administration is going against uh, the FBI and the Justice Department. Uh, what do you make of this in the long run, whether this will limit the intelligence uh, committee's oversight of things and overreach of things? Well, I, I wouldn't go overboard in saying the Democrats have always been critical of the FBI. I, I mean, meant to say progressives. It's really important. <laughs> Progressives, that's fair. But, I mean, as I, as I mentioned, it was just a couple weeks ago when Congress passed the uh, Title VII reauthorization, another part of FISA, and all of the same people uh, pushing to get this memo out, starting with Devin Nunes, Trey Gowdy, the entire Republican side on the House Intelligence Committee, they all pushed to have FISA reauthorized without any reforms. <laughs> Um, and I, I'll, down the road, I will point out that the memo that they released doesn't address a FISA problem that probably did affect Carter Page. So they don't, they're not paying attention to FISA closely enough to talk about the thing that probably did affect Carter Page badly. They don't care that, for example, the government can collect tour uh, traffic including entirely domestic communications, and then weed out which Americans aren't engaged in crime and get rid of it, but keep the ones are, that are engaged in eight enumerated crimes. They don't care that the FBI can access communications collected under 702 warrantlessly uh, without any kind of suspicion at all. So, you know, these people who are pushing for this memo to come clean, to, to come out, really do not care at all and do not, cannot believe that the FBI is an abusive uh, uh, agency, because if they did, they would not have reauthorized this legislation. This is exclusively about trying to invent a reason to discredit the Mueller, the, um, the Mueller investigation. And, you know, will it affect oversight going forward? I think one thing that has been made clear uh, with this whole fiasco is that the House Intelligence Committee doesn't work. And great. Uh, I hope that Republicans will be so embarrassed by the time this is done that they cooperate with people, with good government reformers who have been saying for a long time there are ways to improve the House Intelligence Committee and make it functional such that Devin Nunes can't take it hostage and turn it into a, uh, 
a mode of obstruction for the president. You know, I meant to say progressive activists, not even Democratic Congress members, when it came to <laughs> being concerned about FBI and intelligence and NSA overreach. But you mentioned Trey Gowdy. And yesterday, the Republican congressman uh, uh, from South Carolina, a chair of the House Oversight Committee, announced he is not going to seek reelection. He was instrumental in crafting the Nunes memo. Can you talk about the significance of him leaving Congress, leader in the Benghazi investigation, attacking Hillary Clinton, etc.? Yeah, uh, Trey Gowdy, when he's in front of a camera, is one of the most blustery Republican partisans. But you can tell, even from, for example, from the Carter Page transcript, uh, his interview with the House Intelligence Committee, that behind closed doors, he actually is a competent prosecutor, which is, you know, he's got a background in that. Um, and he can hammer Republican witnesses. So what's interesting about Gowdy is that he, the underlying materials, this is another complaint the Democrats have, the only people who have read the underlying materials are Adam Schiff, four staffers, two of Adam Schiff's and two of Devin Nunes's, and Trey Gowdy. It, it would have been Devin Nunes, but Devin Nunes, probably because of the recusal you talked about earlier, uh, had Gowdy do it instead. So the only people who've actually looked at the underlying materials include Trey Gowdy. Now, he didn't write the memo. Nunes's staffers did. So there's this game of telephone going on already. On Sunday, on one of the Sunday shows, Trey, I think it was a Fox show, Trey Gowdy said, you know, um, this memo should come out, it's important, but my side should not use it to undermine the Mueller investigation. And the reason he gave is that what is not being seen about the Mueller investigation is there's a whole counterintelligence side to it. There's a whole side of it investigating how the Russians tampered in our election. And according to, to Gowdy, who has seen these underlying documents, he thinks that's an important and legitimate investigation. Now, we don't know fully why he decided not to run. He did cite yesterday that he's sick of politics. But what's interesting is, yesterday morning, he was still fundraising. So as of yesterday morning, he was still planning on running. There's also reports that um, Don McGahn, who is the White House counsel, who has been in this sort of obstructive role for Trump as well, was, was discussing with Gowdy a position on the Fourth Circuit as a, as a circuit court judge, which is something Gowdy has been interested in the past, and Gowdy turned that down. So Gowdy, even though he is this um, fire-breathing partisan hack, you know, you go back to the Benghazi case, he seems to have seen something in the underlying investigation that, that troubles him that his Republican partisan colleagues are, are not paying attention to. And, and so, Gowdy yeah, may surprise us going forward, but I do think that uh, that is an interesting development yesterday, that the one guy on the House Intelligence Committee who's actually seen the underlying intelligence um, has decided to get out of the Republican partisan hackery rat race. And finally, Marcy Wheeler, we just have 30 seconds, but the whole issue of whether Mueller will be interviewing President Trump and President Trump saying he's very willing to testify under oath and then his lawyer walking that back. But the significance of this. Well, people should remember that Trump is not going to be indicted for obstruction. He might be indicted, he might be named as a, a, a unindicted co conspirator. But he's not—I mean, like, it, 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 he's very unlikely to be indicted for anything because he's the sitting president. But it is possible that, for example, Hope Hicks—the New York Times had a report on her possibly obstructing justice last night—she could be indicted or uh, forced into a plea deal on obstruction, and Trump could be named in that. And I think that's what's really going on. His lawyers don't want Trump to sit for an interview because he can't tell the truth for more than 10 minutes, and I don't blame them. But that go that back and forth is going to go on for some time and add pressure to the president, I think. Marcy Willer, we want to thank you for being with us, independent journalist covering national security and civil liberties, running the website emptywheel.net. We'll link to your piece, your latest pieces. And um, the latest one, Byron York, confirms that many names and sources implicated Carter Page as an agent of a foreign power. Uh, speaking to us from Grand Rapids, Michigan, this is Democracy Now! When we come back, we go to Kabul, Afghanistan. Stay with us.
Well, I'm going down the track. I got tears in my eyes. Trying to read a letter from my home. If this train run me right, I'll be home by tomorrow night. Cause I'm 900 miles from my home. And I hate to hear that lonesome whistle blow. miles, Barbara Dane. Here on Democracy Now!, I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. On Tuesday night, President Trump became the third president in a row to attempt to put a positive spin on the war in Afghanistan, the longest war in U.S. history. Our warriors in Afghanistan have new rules of engagement. Along with their heroic Afghan partners, our military is no longer undermined by artificial timelines, and we no longer tell our enemies our plans. Five years earlier, President Barack Obama predicted at his 2013 State of the Union that the war would soon be over. Our forces will move into a support role, while Afghan security forces take the lead. Tonight, I can announce that over the next year, another 34,000 American troops will come home from Afghanistan. This drawdown will continue. And by the end of next year, our war in Afghanistan will be over. And uh, back in 2005, President George W. Bush used his State of the Union, I think it was 2006, to praise Afghanistan for building a, quote, new democracy. We remain on the offensive in Afghanistan. I, I got where a fine president and a national assembly are fighting terror while building the institutions of a new democracy. Well, more than 16 years after the U.S. war in Afghanistan began, the country remains in a state of crisis. On Saturday, more than 100 people died in Kabul when an ambulance packed with explosives blew up. Then, on Monday, Islamic State militants carried out an early morning attack on a military academy in the western outskirts of the capital of Kabul, killing at least 11 troops and wounding 16. For more, we go to Kabul, Afghanistan, where we're joined by investigative reporter Mei Zhang. Her most recent piece for The Intercept is titled, Losing Sight, a four-year-old girl was the sole survivor of a U.S. drone strike in Afghanistan, then she disappeared. Mei Zhang is also a Logan nonfiction fellow at the Cary Institute. Institute for Global Good and a visiting scholar at New York University's Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. May, it's great to have you with us, joining us from Kabul. Uh, first, respond to this incredibly bloody week in Afghanistan, in, in the ring of steel in Kabul. Yes, as uh, you, Amy, and Nermeen mentioned, um, it's been a terrible, terrible uh, winter, really, for Afghanistan. Um, just before coming on air, I was talking to my colleagues about um, the bloodbath that has been, you know, Kabul for the past couple of weeks. Um, apart from the, MO, the the massive attack, the MOI on the MOI road, the Ministry of Interior road, and um, the military academy, there's also been the Intercontinental Hotel that has been attacked. Um, in a nearby city in Jalalabad, Save the Children office, uh, an NGO there, was attacked as well. And there's, re there's a real sense of a crescendoing of violence, and there's real um, helplessness among the people about the lack of options that are, you know, provided for them, and also a massive grievance and resentment. Um, today, there was a protest in front of the um, embassy in Pakistan here, in Kabul, um, organized by civil society members who wanted to, you know, protest the um, the, the, the absence of lack of action on part of the Afghan government, um, which is exactly the thing that the message that the Taliban was hoping to to send. You know, these spectacular attacks, they are, in a way, you, 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 they could be PR disasters in a way for the insurgent group. Most, most of the people who die are civilian, civilians. Um, but they do this because the message that they want to send to the public is telling them that your government cannot protect you. It's this, it's become this sick, um, a uh, popularity contest, almost, between the Afghan state and various insurgent groups, um, the Taliban, ISIS, the Kani network, you know, being being among the the, the, the big ones. Um, but the other the 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 other note that you detect among the people here is that um, for foreign foreigners watching from abroad. 
this week seems very bloody, but this kind of atrocity happens on a daily basis in uh, provinces that we have no you know, access to, never mind the fact that the war has been ongoing, the, the NATO war, as we call it here, has been ongoing for 17 years, and even before that, there's been the civil war, the Russian, you know, Soviet occupation, and, um, and yeah, I mean, people here have been living with this kind of conflict. Sorry, there's a, um, speaking of which, a NATO uh, helicopter overhead, so you might be able to hear me, but um, it's been a continuation of, of conflict in various iterations, and with that has come various coping mechanisms, one of which is humor. And so my colleague and I were talking about how at this um, uh, protest earlier, um, people who had, you know, they, they were meant to have been burning the, the a, a flag of Pakistan, um, which can be uh, confused with um, the national flag of Nigeria. And so there were some protesters who were mistakenly burning a Nigerian flag, and you know there was there was a rare respite from this sort of a uh, moment of unexpected um, humor. But that's what people do here to to get by, because otherwise, um, taking everything, um, really internalizing everything that happens. I think is, you know, that way lies insanity for a lot of people. Well, May, you talked about the fact that this protest that took place in Kabul took place outside the Pakistani embassy, uh, and that protesters were burning uh, the Pakistani flag. Can you talk about the role of Pakistan, uh, the Pakistani state and military uh, intelligence services in Afghanistan, in particular their relationship to uh, two of the three groups that you mentioned, uh, insurgent groups, the Taliban and uh, the Haqqani network? Of course, um, it's widely established now that um, the Taliban and the Haqqani network have their safe, he safe heavens in Pakistan, which is the way um, that they've, been managed, they've managed to operate, um, consolidate their power, and also, um, you know, arrange for um, funding streams. And um, it's a very contentious, controversial topic here. Um, President Ashraf Ghani, when he first came to power in late 2014, used a lot of his political power, um, political capital, pardon me, to try to negotiate peace um, by going straight to Islamabad. But that did not, um, that didn't amount to anything. Um, and uh, but the reason why he did that was because he, you know, like all the, you know, the, the head of state before him, understood that. Um, if you want to have a peace, you know, a peace settlement with the Taliban, it's not just that particular insurg insurgent group, pardon me, that you are uh, dealing with. It's all these other stakeholders of the conflict that are at play. You know, um, we often talk about the war in Afghanistan as a proxy war. Um, who are the you know, who are the proxies? Afghanistan and Pakistan. Who are their backers? I mean, the the obvious one for the Afghan um, government right now is you know the American government. And um, on the other side, for the Taliban, it is um, the, the government of Pakistan. And um, President um, Donald Trump has been making a lot of um, public statements about how he wants to, you know, cut funding to force the Pakistan state to, you know, force them into submission. Um, but, I mean, uh, the American uh, policy towards Pakistan, I mean, of course, and also Afghanistan, has been very inconsistent. And so it's no wonder that the actors don't respond to these incentive structures that are presented to them, because so let's it's unclear for them how long this will last. Let's talk about the U.S. role. You just did a, a very important piece called Losing Sight. A four-year-old girl was the sole survivor of a U.S. drone strike in Afghanistan, and then she disappeared. Talk about this story and uh, its significance for what the U.S. is doing there. I think the important thing to know about know about note about this story is that it's about a specific drone strike. Oh, just one of them, one of many. There's been hundreds and hundreds over the course of, um, you know, the duration of the war here. This particular strike happened in September of 2013. There was a family um, traveling in a pickup truck from Asadabad, which is the provincial capital of Kunar province. Kunar province is to the east of Kabul. That's where Lone Survivor was shot, you know, for audiences who might be aware of that, or um, Restrepo as well, the documentary um, by Sebastian Younger and um, Tim Hetherington. And at, um, from Asadabad, they set off um, midday, and uh, they, were, they were on their way to Gambir province, which is in the Pech Valley, um, which is where majority of the, um, the, the family members were from. And along the way, this truck was hit by what the American military calls the precision strike, and everyone died. 
um, except for a four-year-old girl who was then um, taken to a hospital, hospital, pardon me, um, in another town called Jalalabad, and then to a um, French World Three hospital in Kabul, the military hospital here. Um, she came to prominence among um, in the Afghan local media initially because President Karzai, who um, who was the head of state at the time, who had been, you know, increasingly, um, you know, growing vocal about his um, anger and discontent at the um, preponderance of civilian casualties um, incurred by uh, NATO, the foreign troops, um, went to go see her, and then in successive remarks uh, publicly, he had, he would sort of often evoke her as one of the many reasons why he did not want to sign this thing called the Bilateral Securities Agreement. This is the, the BSA is the, 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 um, the memorandum of understanding that allows for foreign troops to remain in, Af in Afghanistan. And um, the negotiation for the BSA was ongoing at the time in 2013 and then onwards into 2014. And when he was often asked about his recalcitrance for, you know, signing the agreement, he would, you know, mention this girl, Aisha. Um, as well as, you know, many other, you know, instances of you know, wedding parties being bombed, um, <sighs> houses being bombed, um, mothers and fathers, you know, taking their children to school being bombed. I mean, the, the countless, you know, attacks that have happened um, on civilians during this, the war here. And th my, my investigation really tried to bore into what happens to just one of them. And um, the, the human cost of this policy that we call um, clean. I mean, we have all these, you know, words like, you know, it being a precision strike or it's me the drone, drones are meant to be the saner option to the, the, the bloodiness of um, ground, ground battle. But really, as I mentioned in the piece, we don't, we don't, at times we don't even know who we kill. Well, May, uh, a lot of people suggest, though, that um, U.S. and other NATO ground troops are necessary in Afghanistan uh, to maintain a modicum of, of security. Uh, a BBC study uh, uh, found yesterday, which was just published yesterday, uh, found that the Taliban are now operative in uh, 70 percent of the country, which is, of course, far more uh, uh, than was the case in, in 2014. So, uh, could you respond to that. I mean, do you think, uh, uh, despite these uh, 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 casualties, the girl Aisha, whom you mentioned, uh, that a U.S. presence is, is necessary in Afghanistan, as, as some suggest? Absolutely not. The, the places where people suffer the most are in contested areas where there's still battle between government forces and various insurgent groups. You mentioned that 70 percent of the country is under Taliban control. Areas that are um, very safely with one side or the other are not being fought over. Therefore, there is no, you know, active battle there. Um, I think that's something that we often forget. There's, you know, over the past 17 years, there's been a lot of money that's been spent on, you know, gender initiatives and, you know, promoting women's rights and children's rights and um, capacity building exercises and, and all this stuff. And that's all very good. But I think what people often forget is that even before we can get to the part of being enlightened or in part or whatever, um, most Afghans, you know, their primary desire is to, 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 to live and not to die. And for that to happen, the war needs to end. And why is the war continuing? The war continues because there's no um, understanding of the fact that we are in a stalemate and both sides are suffering. Um, both sides cling on to this delusional fiction that a military victory is possible. I mean, President Trump is still talking about the fact that um, he still subscribes to this insane logic that what we actually need to do is to um, advance the war so that we um, negotiate from an advantage. I mean, what is the definition of insanity? It's doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And as you, Amy, earlier mentioned, these State of the Union speeches are tragic for the fact that, you know, they're just iterations of the, the one that's come before when it comes to Afghanistan. Nothing has changed. So what makes us think that this mini surge that President Trump has allowed Gen um, General Mattis to, you know, go ahead with, that's going to make any difference? When under President Obama, we had 140,000 soldiers in country, and that didn't change anything. We're going to lose the satellite in a minute, but I wanted to ask you about this meeting President Trump had with members of the U.N. Security Council rejecting the idea of peace talks with the Taliban. What is your assessment of this? It, it's 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 a real shame. Um, it saddens me personally deeply. Um, there's a certain momentum that's been built with these peace talks. I mean, the fact that we have an, an, a 
wh how, whatever you feel about the Taliban, I mean, I think we, we can all agree that having, you know, dialogue is a good thing. And, um, you know, a lot of resources have been spent um, trying to get people um, onto the negotiating table. And for a head of state of a major country that is a big player in the war to come out saying, you know, d denouncing the whole process really takes back, the, you know, the, the prospects for peace um, by many, many years. I mean, people, people don't talk about we just lost the satellite, but that's Mei Jung, who's an investigative reporter based in Kabul, Afghanistan. Her most recent piece we'll link to at The Intercept, uh, called Losing Sight, a four-year-old girl was the sole survivor of a U.S. drone strike in Afghanistan. Then she disappeared. Uh, this is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. When we come back, a new book is out. It's called Lost Connections. We'll look at the issue of anti depressants, depression, and the best treatments for a very common malady. Stay with us. The Rip Portishead here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. We turn now to mental illness and its treatment in the United States. According to the National Institutes of Health, the disease is widely prevalent. Almost 20 percent of adult Americans suffer from mental illness every year. Anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in the U.S., affecting 40 million adults in the U.S., or 18 percent of the population, every year. About 7 percent of adult Americans suffer from major depression. According to the World Health Organization, the U.S. is one of the most depressed countries in the world, and globally, depression is the leading cause of ill health and disability. Depression is also the major contributor to suicides worldwide, which number close to 800,000 a year. The National Alliance on Mental Illness finds that more than half of Americans don't receive treatment for mental illness. Well, we now turn to a new book that argues the people who do receive treatment for depression and anxiety are not being treated adequately. Author Johan Hari says too much emphasis is placed on brain chemistry to the exclusion of equally and often more important environmental causes. He points specifically to what he calls, quote, junk values, writing, quote, junk food has taken over our diets and it's making millions of people physically sick. A growing body of scientific evidence suggests that something similar is happening with our minds, that they've become dominated by junk values, and this is making us mentally sick, triggering soaring rates of depression and anxiety. Johan Hari has experienced mental illness himself, found he was still depressed after having been on antidepressants for well over a decade, starting when he was a teenager. In his research, Johan Hari found his experience was far from unique and that a staggering 65 to 80 percent of people on antidepressants continue to be depressed. Well, Johan Hari joins us now from Washington, D.C. Um, he is a writer and a journalist. His book on depression is called Lost Connections. Uncovering the Real Causes of Depression and the Unexpected Solutions. His previous book, Chasing the Scream, the first and the last days of the war on drugs. Johan, welcome back to Democracy Now! Let's start with the title, because I think that very much conveys what uh, your underlying thesis is, Lost Connections. Yeah. So everyone watching this knows that they have natural physical needs, right? You need food, you need water, you need clean air, you need warmth. If I took those away from you, things would go real wrong real fast. One of the things I learned on the 
big journey I did for this book, over 40,000 miles, interviewing the best experts in the world on what causes depre depression and anxiety and what solves them, is there's equally strong evidence that we have natural psychological needs. You've got to feel you belong. You've got to feel your life has meaning and purpose. You've got to feel that people see you and value you. You've got to feel you've got a future that makes sense. And our culture is good at lots of things, but we've been getting less and less good at meeting people's deep underlying psychological needs. And that's one of the key reasons why we have this exploding depression and anxiety crisis. So that can sound a bit weird in the abstract, so I'll give you a specific example. I noticed that lots of the people I know who are depressed and anxious, their depression and anxiety focuses around their work. So I started to look at the evidence. How do people feel about their work in our culture? Turns out Gallup did the best research on this. 13% of us like our work most of the time. 63% of us are what they call sleep working. You don't like it, you don't hate it. 24% of people hate their work. So you think about that. 87% of people don't like the thing they're doing most of their waking lives. I started to think, could that have some relationship to our mental health crisis? So I discovered that an incredible Australian social scientist called Professor Michael Marmot, who discovered the core in the 1970s of what makes you depressed at work. If you go to work and you feel you have low or no control, you are significantly more likely to become depressed or even more likely to have a heart attack. That's because human beings have a need to feel their life is meaningful. And if you're controlled, that disrupts your ability to create meaning. And I started to think, chemical, so I believe strongly that chemical antidepressants have a real role. They give some relief to some people. But I started to think, what would be the antidepressant for that problem, right, which is so prevalent in our culture? And I learned there is one. In Baltimore, not far from where I am now, I went and met a woman called Meredith Keogh. Meredith used to go to bed every Sunday night, just sick with anxiety about her work. And one day with her husband, Josh, she did this quite bold thing. Josh had worked in bike stores since he was a teenager, which is, you know, insecure, controlled work. And Josh and Meredith decided they were going to set up a bike store with their colleagues that ran on a different principle. It's a democratic cooperative. You might call it democracy now. The way it works is they, they don't have a boss. They take all the big decisions together. They, they uh, share the profits, obviously. They share out the good tasks and the less good tasks, so no one gets stuck with the, you know, more depressing tasks. And one of the things that was so fascinating spending time with them and in other democratic cooperatives is how many of them talked about how depressed and anxious they've been in their previous workplace, but they weren't now, which is completely in line with Professor Marmot's findings. And as Josh put it to me, there's no reason why any workplace should operate like this. We have a society that is putting in place all sorts of structures that are causing depression and anxiety, yet we tell people this. So your depression and anxiety, if you're watching this, I learned about these nine causes of depression and anxiety for which there is scientific evidence. Two are biological and the rest are in the way we live. If you're depressed, if you're anxious, you're not crazy. You're not a machine with broken parts. You're a human being with unmet needs. And there are ways we can change our society so that those needs are met and you won't be in such pain. Well, uh, Johan Hari, I want to ask you about some of the criticism uh, uh, your book has received. Uh, in a Guardian piece headlined, as a psychiatrist, I know that Johan Hari is wrong to cast doubt on antidepressants. Carmine Parianti writes, quote, just as knowing that you have broken your legs in a car crash does not miraculously heal your broken bones, knowing the rational reason for being depressed does not make depression any less real or the sufferer any less in need of support and treatment. She disputes the argument in your book that depression and anxiety are treated only as a chemical problem by the psychi psychiatric community. She goes on to say, quote, that you're suggesting that prescribing antidepressants to a patient who suffers from clinical depression is the equivalent of treating them as a machine with malfunctioning parts is wrong, unhelpful, and even dangerous. Antidepressants yeah, are no cure-all, but demonizing them plays into stigma, meaning that, tragically, more people will be held back from receiving help for a debilitating uh, condition. Yeah, so, Johan Hari, can you respond yeah. to that? And specifically, yeah. uh, 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 the claim that she makes that your book uh, demonizes uh, uh, an illness that's already uh, uh, demonized and stigmatized, and that people already hesitate uh, uh, to go on antidepressants precisely because of this stigma. Yeah, the individual you mentioned admits they've not read the book. In the book, I'm very clear. I want to expand the menu of options for people with depressed and anxious people. I don't want to take anything off the menu. Some of the people I most love, some of my closest relatives, take chemical antidepressants. I've never urged them to stop. Chemical antidepressants do give some relief to some people, which is really valuable. 
They don't solve the problem. This isn't just my position. This is the position of the World Health Organization. World Health Organization explains mental health is produced socially. It is a social indicator. It needs social as well as individual solutions. So we need to be able to have a serious conversation about these causes that doesn't just descend into kind of ridiculous straw men. Of course, I'm not against chemical antidepressants. I took them for 13 years. Some of the people I most love take them. But we have to be able to talk about the wider context that's happening and how we deal with that. One thing that helped me really change how I think about this is when I went to interview a professor called Derek Summerfield, amazing South African psychiatrist, and he explained to me, he was in Cambodia when they first introduced chemical antidepressants, right? And the doctors there didn't know what they were. So he explained, and they said, oh, we don't need them. We've already got antidepressants. And he said, what do you mean? They explained, they talked about a farmer in their community who worked in the rice fields who one day got blown up by a landmine. They gave him an artificial limb, he went back to work in the fields. And um, he started just to become very depressed. Apparently, it's very painful to work underwater with an artificial limb. He, I imagine it's pretty traumatic. He starts just crying all day, didn't want to get out of bed. They said, we gave him an antidepressant. Derek said, what did you do? They said, we went, we sat with him, we listened to his problems, we realized that his pain made sense. We figured if we bought him a cow, he could become a dairy farmer, he wouldn't be so depressed. They bought him a cow within a few weeks, his crying stopped. Now, what those Cambodian doctors knew intuitively is what the World Health Organization has been trying to tell us for years, that our depression makes sense. Far from stigmatizing depressed people, I think this destigmatizes them. There's actually a really interesting experiment I go through in Lost Connections that demonstrates this really powerfully. Because what we've done up to now is we've told people an exclusively biological story about their distress. That's what my doctor told me. Now, there are real biological factors to depression, but most of the causes are in the way we live. And I think that's much more powerfully destigmatizing. It says, it's not you. You're actually surrounded by loads of people who feel this way. You feel this way for perfectly some reasons. And of course, Dr. Pariente, who, who to be fair to him, um, is a man, uh, not a woman, uh, said he agrees with me on these social causes and that we need to deal with these deeper social causes. I think part of the problem is we've been in this funk of pessimism where we think we can't change anything. There are loads of experiments that have demonstrated that we can powerfully change them. I'll give you one example. In Canada in the 1970s, something has been covered by democracy now really well. In Canada in the 1970s, they did an experiment. They chose a town at random called Dauphin. It's near Manitoba. And they gave a huge number of people in this town a guaranteed basic income. It was the equivalent of $15,000 a year. They said to them, we're just going to give you this money in monthly installments. There's nothing you have to do in return for it. And there's nothing you can do that means we'll take it away. And they followed what happened over the next three years. The most powerful thing for me is there was a massive fall in depression and anxiety. Depression and anxiety that was so severe people had to be hospitalized fell by 9%. Now, that tells us something. It tells us the financial insecurity of neoliberalism that you guys document so brilliantly is causing a lot of that depression and anxiety. Firstly, it's very empowering to people to tell them, your depression is caused by these factors in the way we're living. It's not that you're just your brain is broken. There are factors in your brain going on, of course. We're biological beings. But that's not the primary driver here. And there are solutions that we can band together and fight for. That's much more destigmatizing and empowering. And it's not a kind of straw man about saying the drugs are bad. Johan, earlier this month, British Prime Minister Theresa May appointed a minister for loneliness following a year-long investigation which found 14 percent of the population in the U.K. often or always feels lonely. Can you talk about the connection between loneliness and depression? And you have 20 seconds. Yeah, we are the loneliest society there's ever been. Professor John Cassiopo at Chicago University has shown that. There are doctors that have started prescribing lonely people to take part in voluntary gardening groups. That is twice as effective as chemical antidepressants in reducing depression. We've got to look at the wider solutions. The book goes through the nine causes of depression and anxiety for which there is scientific evidence and seven different kinds of antidepressant that we should be utilizing alongside chemical antidepressants. We're going to do part two of this discussion. We'll post it online at democracynow.org. Johan Hari's new book is out. It is called Lost Connections, Uncovering the Real Causes of Depression and the Unexpected Solutions. That does it for our broadcast, Democracy now is hiring a full-time news fellow. Submit your application by February 5th to democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Shea.